Half a day and good afternoon. The Committee on Housing, Utilities, Public Safety, and Homeland Security is, is now called to order. This public hearing, excuse me, Homeland Security, Homeland Security is calling this public hearing to order. It is now 1.20 p.m. on Wednesday, October 10, 2018. Notice of this public hearing was provided to senators, stakeholders, and local media. A five-day notice was provided on Tuesday, October 2, 2018 and a 48-hour notice was provided on Monday, October 8, 2018, thus meeting the requirements of the open government law. Uh, the public hearing is also being broadcasted on local television, um, so please speak clearly into the microphone. The committee will continue to receive written testimony until 2 p.m. on October 12, 2018. Testimonies may be hand-delivered or mailed to the Guam Congress building at 163 Chalo, Chalan Santo Papa, Haganya Guam, 96910. Or it may be emailed to Senator T.C. Nelson at guamlegislature.org. Okay. I know in the agenda it states that we were going to do Bill 144 first, but I'd like us to uh, address Bill number 324, um, just so that we can spend a little bit more time on Bill number 144. I'd like to thank uh, Speaker Terlahi uh, Senator Mary Torres and Senator Lee for their attendance. And we will address Bill number 324. Bill number 324 is an act to add a new subsection 51.40 to Chapter 59, Title 9, Guam Code Annotated, relative to the criminaliz criminalization of disarming of peace officers introduced by myself as stated in the bill's intent, there is currently no law criminalizing the act of disarming a peace officer. Such an act presents a clear danger to the community due to the type of response we could expect from the peace officer, especially in a crowded area. By codifying the crime, we can be more clear about the severity of this issue. I'd also like to address the elephant in the room. For those who suspect that this bill is meant to continue uh, the situation at the GVB uh, barbecue block party in the past months. This bill was introduced in response to the lack of a statute criminalizing the act as these charges would not be applicable to this certain situation as it would be enacted after the fact. I also want to remind the public that this isn't the only time in recent history that an officer was disarmed. In 2015, murder suspect Dimitri Lobanov disarmed a peace officer during routine processing at the Haganya precinct. The, the suspect then aimed the weapon at a detective and was met with the expected response as the other officers aimed at the suspect and ordered him to stand down. Rather than doing so, the suspect discharged the weapon upon himself and died of the self-inflicted gunshot wound. If the suspect had not discharged the weapon on himself, he would not have been charged with the act of a disarming of a peace officer, as it is not currently codified. And perhaps the conversation of whether or not it should be criminalized would have been more greatly discussed in the community. And uh, I'd like to now call uh, anyone that would like to testify on bill number 324. Half a day, ma'am. Half a day. Uh, can you please state your name for the record? Yes, ma'am. Half a day, Madam Chair. Members of the Guam, uh, uh, Third Fort Guam Legislature. My name is uh, Stephen Stephen A. Amagan. A, a police lieutenant that has been blessed to be employed with the Guam Police Department for 27 years and currently the Deputy Precinct Commander for Haganya Precinct Command. I am here today to show my support for Bill 324-34, which is an act to add a new subsection 55.40 to chapter 55, which is the interference with the government operations and law enforcement of 
Title IX of the Guam Code annotated relative to the criminalization of disarming of peace officers. Throughout my 20 years as a police officer with the Guam Police Department, I can only recall two incidents that peace officers were disarmed. One instance where a person has successfully retrieved a firearm from a peace officer and then shooting himself and our law enforcement community was blessed that the peace officer was not harmed. And the reason why I'm here too, because I was tasked to oversee the investigation and I know how uh, lucky we were at that time that uh, the police officer or the peace officer uh, survived that uh, incident. Second incident is of this year that prompted this bill to be introduced to criminalize this act. Again, we were blessed that no one was injured as a, as a result of the recent incident. I said that the deputy commander, precinct commander of Obaganya Precinct Command, safety is always my concern for my fellow workers, fellow public servants who are out patrolling our streets 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Shortly after the last incident, I informed our patrol supervisors to have our patrol officers take extra precautionary measures while in public performing their duties in serving and protecting our community, our island, and our people. Precautionary measures in the event that other members of our community will follow the trend of disar disarming our peace officers. This bill, when passed into law, will make the public be aware that it is illegal to disarm a peace officer. I am humbly asking for your overwhelming support of this bill. The passage of this bill is indicative of your support for the safety of our peace officers, especially our hardworking men and women in blues, our front line of defense that are out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week in their efforts to keep our island safe. Uh, that concludes my uh, testimony, short and brief. Thank you, Mr. Magwin. I'd like to also add that this, the nationwide, um, in multiple jurisdictions, there is already laws in place that do say that it is illegal to disarm a police officer or a law enforcement officer. So this is absolutely something that we need to do, I feel. And um, I'd, like to open in, in, I'd like to open it up for any of the senators if they have any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just at this time want to thank you so much for coming forward and providing this testimony. It's very important that members of our community participate in this process in this way. And, and I certainly want to thank you for your 27 years of service to our island, but also for giving us um, a little insight, especially since you were involved in the first incident. Um, so we certainly want to work with the committee to ensure that not only are our law enforcement officers safe every single day, but that they you know, do their, their great work in protecting all of us in our community. So thank you for your service and thank you very much for your testimony to Dismasi. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> thank you again, Mr. Amagwin. Uh, just wanted to check when, you, when the officers were requested to take pre additional precautionary measures. Is there a standard precautionary measure that well, all, they have all, been advised to take? Or? Yes, all I informed them is uh, just be aware of their surroundings, situational awareness, to make sure that you know their their space are not invaded while they're uh, pretty much uh, performing their duties out there in the streets. Because uh, pretty much they are my coworkers. And anything happens to them, I'll be more than uh, more responsible. I'll be have to answer to the family why no uh, precautionary measures were taken, or any type of trainings that were provided for our personnel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Amagwin, for having the courage to come down here and and speak in support of this bill. Um, I. I want to thank you for all the hard work you've done. 
uh, in ensuring that we are protected, ensuring that the community is protected. And I want to thank um, your colleagues, our law enforcement officers, for doing so as well. Um, I feel that this bill is a, is a proper bill to really ensure that also as policymakers, we are charged to protect those who protect us. And so thank you for your continued um, selfless service and sacrifice willingly putting on the uniform, knowing that every day is a, is an, is a day that you, a possible harm to you or your fellow law, law enforcement uh, personnel. So thank you and, and thank you for coming down. Lastly, ma'am, I just want to thank you for introducing this bill. Now I can uh, pretty much uh, rest assured that I'll be able to sleep well at night, that we have some measures, hopefully it will pass that will protect our men, women, and blue out there in the street, and my fellow peace officers here on island that's protecting this island. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now we will address uh, bill number 144-34. Uh, just a, a quick uh, recap of what has transpi transpired in the past year and a half. Uh, we have held uh, several roundtable hearings um, and multiple meetings to discuss this landlord-tenant bill. Um, many people, uh, many senators in the past uh, felt that it is, there's certainly a need to pass this bill, but for some reason or another, um, or certainly a need to pass a bill into law that regulates landlord and tenant relationships. But some way or another, um, for decades now, there has not been um, an updated code or statute um, in our books as we transition, uh, as real estate transitions. And so now um, it is, we've been working on this bill for about a year and a half, uh, reaching out to all stakeholders. And um, uh, really in this bill, we want to ensure the safety of landlord and tenants uh, relationships. And um, we've also uh, consulted many times with our legislative council for to ensure that this bill does not conflict with the current statute in place. And our legislative council has reviewed this bill thoroughly multiple times. And, and so now we are addressing the final form of this bill. Uh, we did have a public hearing in the past in regards to this bill, uh, but uh, if we've, I feel that as due diligence, we readdressed the changes that were made uh, as a result of the public hearing with an additional public hearing to let, the, to let our community know that we are working uh, to ensure that there is a law in place to protect our landlords and our tenants. I'd like to call up uh, anyone who would like to give testimony at this time on bill number 144. I'm sorry, if I may, um, I was asked to just state some of the specifics uh, that we addressed uh, in our previous public hearing on this bill. And if you just bear with me so that the public will know uh, some of the changes that we've made. So uh, in, the, in the previous public hearing, subsection 28201 in reference to the security deposit, uh, there was a statement that the requirement was too vague. So we changed it to one month's rent plus additional $500 for a pet deposit and additional security if tenant has a pet in cases where pet damages become excessive, which is, of course, protecting the interest of the landlord. Um, we also mandated a timeline of 14 days for landlord, landlords to hold security deposit because um, there were a lot of concerns of landlords keeping the security deposit and then perhaps the security deposit it is a bank collecting interest, but the tenant does not receive the security deposit back, back to them and so the interest therefore that is collected goes to whoever is 
renting or leasing out the unit and the tenant only receives the security deposit given. Um, it also sets a statute of limitation of one year for tenants to act to recover security deposit, which sets legal grounds of collecting and legal costs. Subsection 28202, where it says in the insert not caused by tenant, inserts were added at the end of subsection A1 and 2 to ensure protection for the tenant. Subsection 28203 inserts, unless buyer is credited the security deposit and all parties are notified at which time the buyer becomes liable for the security deposit and any refunds, we added at the end of uh, subsection A, this protects the original landlord if building is sold and security deposit is transferred. Subsection 48206, rights to access, was too vague, and so we added recommendations, which is A, the tenant sh shall not unreasonably withhold the tenant's consent to the landlord to enter into the dwelling unit in order to inspect the premise, make necessary or agreed repairs, decoration, alterations, or improvement, supply services as agreed, or exhibit the dwelling unit to prospective purchasers, mortgagers, mortgagees or tenants. And item B, the landlord shall not abuse the right of access nor use it to harass the tenant except in the case of emergency or where, or where impractic, impracticable to do so. The landlord shall give the tenant at least 24 hours notice of the landlord's intent to enter and shall enter only during reasonable hours. Item C, the landlord shall have no other rights of entry except by court order unless the tenant appears to have abandoned the premises or the landlord may, during an extended absence of the tenant, enter the dwelling unit as reasonably necessary for purposes of inspection, maintenance, and safekeeping. Uh, subsection 48303, self-help for minor defects and repairs. Uh, which addresses withholding of rent, which protects both landlord and tenant. Uh, wrongful, subsection 48304, wrongful failure to provide essential services. We insert it in uh, item A2, but in no case will landlord be responsible or liable for costs of substitute housing unless agreed to in writing by both parties. Subsection 48.313, abandonment, and it is defined, um, defines landlord's courses of actions that can be taken if dwelling unit is abandoned. And subsection 48.315, refusal of lawful access. We inserted language, also landlord in item B, also, landlord shall return the portion of the security deposit which is recoverable by the tenant under Section 48201 of this chapter. And so, uh, like I said, it's been 40 years that since we've last had an update to our uh, statute in regards to landlord and tenant um, agreements. And so, I feel that uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their hard work at coming to the table. I'd like to thank um, the Stakeholders Guam Association of Realtors, the Guam Real Estate Commission, Gura Guam Housing uh, Corporation, and also tenants and also uh, independent landlords that have called in and added perspective on the bill. I'd also thank our legal team for working closely with us on uh, ensuring that this bill um, is just and fair and it does not conflict with current law. So uh, perhaps we can start with uh, uh, Gura. Half a day. Um, my name is Pedro A. Leon Guerrero, Jr., Deputy Director over at Gura. Uh, thank you, Senator Nelson and members of the committee for this opportunity to contribute our comments on Bill 144-34-COR, the proposed Guam Landlord and Tenant Rental Act. We have thoroughly reviewed the bill to assess its impacts to housing programs administered by Gura. As the landlord operating 750 units of affordable housing in sites around the island, we are well familiar with the challenges of identifying and retaining good residents. 
Gura also assists thousands of client, clients through the issuance of housing vouchers so that they may rent from private property owners of their choosing. We are fortunate to have the benefit of well-established federal rules and regulations to provide a sound framework for the operation of our residential housing. We were pleased to find that in reviewing our processes against those stipulated in the bill, that our policies capture many of the same requirements. Federal guidance from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, directs that GURA adopt and use the more stringent of the federal or local law, where the two might come to comparison. In the attachment, we took the opportunity to point out any provisions which may conflict with HUD regulations. We also provide comments for your consideration that while not in conflict with federal regulations, may provide a beneficial perspective. Altogether, GURA supports the Bill 144-34. Support for Bill 144-34 is positive. It is our hope that through your bill, landlords and tenants establish a basis of fair play for all who seek to engage in residential real property leasing. Thank you again and God bless. Sincerely. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Leon Grell, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Villeneuve? Half day, Senator Talene Nelson, uh, Senator uh, and committees. Um, uh, my name is Cesar Villanueva. I'm the assist, uh, special assistant to the president of Guam Housing Corporation. Uh, we have reviewed the bill, uh, Bill 144-34, and are in support of the bill. I think it's uh, a very good timing that the uh, committee as a whole had uh, uh, put this bill together, had reviewed it, put many adoptions, ad uh, adoptions to it, um, of course through it because uh, the uh, uh, tenant, tenant and landlord relationship is sometimes can get testy uh, for many reasons and uh, updating it uh, to put a lot of these uh, uh, provisions in it that will help that relationship and fair play like um, our partner here at Gura said. Um, obviously will help will help uh, uh, move the, these processes forward and fair play if it goes to a point where um, you need to go into legal le legal remedies uh, it does protect both parties we uh, at Guam housing do have about 157 low income rentals we do have some issues when we do have tenants that abandon the unit uh, and uh, GHC has to shoulder the cost to repair, replace, and many times uh, we do have uh, uh, position, possessions of the former tenant that we many times would have to uh, discard or um, uh, uh, donate to uh, because of the fact that they just basically leave. So uh, provisions should be in place to prevent those type of things. So uh, we're in support of the uh, bill. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Villanueva. Um, Ms. Miller or Chris? Senator, thank you, Speaker, uh, Senators. I'm Chris Felix. I'm president of the Guam Association of Realtors. Um, and I've been a realtor here in Guam for the past 46 years now. Boy, I'm getting old. Um, and I've been very active in landlord-tenant. This is the, if I remember correctly, the third or fourth attempt to get a landlord-tenant act on Guam. And I, I'd really like to thank you, Senator, for the last year and a half of working with us and all the other players in this field to make this a true Landlord-Tenant Act. Not a Landlord Act and not a Tenant Act, but a Landlord-Tenant Act. This is the first time we've been able to sit down with, your, with you, your staff, especially Bernice. I'd like to thank her for all the work she did on changing and changing. But to be able to sit down and really go through the good, the bad, and the ugly and how to make this really happen. You know, over the last 40 years, you know, we've seen it be a landlord a time for landlords where they control, like if you remember in the 80s, landlords just ruled this island. The, 
poor tenants had no say, no control. Landlords could ask for six months deposits and one year pay in advance and rents for a two bedroom were 1500 a month and take it or leave it. You know, and then it shifted. And just, uh, just a few years ago, it was a tenant act. And the tenants controlled, you know. <laughs> we don't care. If, are you breathing? Okay, come move in, please, you know. And that's the way it has been. This bill, it becomes law, which I really, we really hope it does, will put a play, an even playing field and even this thing out, where even during these shifts, we have something we can fall back on that is fair, fair to both tenants and fair to both landlords. We've tried hard to be fair in our work with you, Senator. We think we have. There's parts we gave in that we didn't want to give in, but you fought for and you were right. You know, and there are parts we fought for and we felt we were right and we appreciate your giving in. So we just, uh, we stand in support of this bill. There's one minor change, section 48311, subsection B. There's a clause there that talks about 30 days. You adjusted the upper part to five days. You forgot to adjust that part to 30. We've discussed it and it's all been agreed to that it should be a five-day notice because otherwise it leads into two, three months of somebody can float without paying any rent, and this will make it fair. So that's, besides that, um, this is exactly what we've worked out. We think it's fair and reasonable, and we stand in support, and we thank you for all the hard work you've done on this. Thank you very much, Chris. Mrs. Miller, would you like to? Thank you. Uh, Maria Miller. Uh, immediate past president of GAR. I'm just here basically to support this. I appreciate it so much. It's been my goal for the past 12 years since I landed in Guam to have a landlord tenant code here, you know, so I'm, I'm very thankful and uh, I'm in total support of this bill with that exception that we changed the 30 days to five days, you know, and thank you very much. Right. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out and uh, I'm tracking the change and uh, it was overlooked and so um, and we also received the email so thank you for uh, the email and so we will address that um, as we move it forward for uh, on the session floor and uh, yes it's been a, a long road and um, I'm, I'm glad that we can see something concrete come into fruition with all the hard work that the community has done and uh, all the stakeholders. So thank you very much for bearing with us also and uh, being flexible and the meetings, making yourself available for the meetings that we requested to ensure that we do have a Landlord Tenant Act. And so I'd like to thank all of you today. Okay. This has exhausted our schedule for the public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got a little bit excited. Uh, I'd like to open it up for the uh, for the uh, uh, my colleagues to ask any questions. Um, I just want to thank Gora for for taking the time to look at the the little um, nuances and the minor corrections that you know were, were a lot of times they're just typographical or, or they're just overlooked in the redrafting of things. But there's one thing I wanted to note. Um, that also in section 48101 it addresses territorial application and I think that the use of territory um, is is not prohibited so we, we might just want to take that out and I'm sure it's just an oversight from um, the past but territory should be eliminated from there but I also it, it was interesting when I first looked at the landlord tenant act and, and looked at the history of, of introduction of them we always have a situation and Mr. Felix uh, alluded to this of in, in real estate, there's always a, a pro lessee point of view and a pro lessor point of view, and it's smart that we now have something that is considered neutral ground. But I think more so in looking at the the, the rental market on Guam, uh, there are two things that this, the community has been sensitive to that I believe this legislation addresses. Um, one is we have a transient population with the military um, for example, that comes in and out are contract workers who are accustomed to a standard. And this then brings us closer to that standard that is um, 
customary across the nation and other areas. So that's a very good thing for Guam to have a standard um, operating uh, rental act. But I think the other thing too that a lot of us have been sensitive to is what we perceive as a slum landlord situation where people who are disadvantaged or aren't very savvy in the, in the world of, of real estate are taken advantage of. And for the people that, that are more disadvantaged or don't have the wherewithal to seek help, um, this is a very good relief for them. So I want to commend the author for address for introducing a rental act that not only levels the playing field but does an equal good for the advantaged landlord with the wherewithal and also the disadvantaged um, tenant who may not know that they are being taken advantage of um, or, or mistreated. So I think you know, this is a home run uh, piece of legislation. So congratulations and thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Senator Torres. Yeah. Speaker I just wanted to clarify that if it's all of your understanding, because at the other, at an, at an earlier hearing, I know there were several, but at one of them, there was a discussion about whether this would apply to residential versus commercial leases. And so um, I'm seeing that the definition of dwelling is the same as the introduced bill, but what is your understanding? I think it's covered in 4101 that it's residential only. Yeah, it looks like it does like not it... address commercial relationships. All right. That for it dwelling, says a, a dwelling, for dwelling unit. Yeah, within and so the dwelling, territory. the definition is exactly the same as it was in the original bill. Yeah. and I think you were the one that brought that up at the hearing, though. So that's why I wanted to make sure that. I appreciate it. No, we just wanted to make sure that commercial was okay. not involved. Right, and it was brought to my attention. I was okay, corrected. And okay. thank you. Perfect. Then thank you, so speaker. we're all in agreement. And I very much appreciate your testimony, all of you. Uh, it's, it's great to hear that uh, you're, you, you've worked through all the issues that you, you found um, in the bill. And, and I very much appreciate the detail that you've provided to us. That's very helpful. Sito Smasi. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Senator Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, I also want to thank you all for, for participating in this process. And, and I know that all of the stakeholders have really come together with Senator Nelson's office and, and spent a great deal of time on this. And so we appreciate that because we all know that sometimes the devil really is in the details. And so we want to make sure that we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's with regard to this, well, all of the legislation that we're we're addressing. Um, it's my understanding that the senator, I guess after a um, public hearing or a round table discussion that we had on this bill in August of 2017 uh, received some feedback from GAR and there were a couple of definitions that you had asked um, to be changed and I think all of them were changed with, with the exception of just one. So I wanted to just ask you um, the suggestion for, it's on page four of the bill, um, under the definitions, letter H, essential services, is a little bit different than what you had suggested. So your suggestion was essential services should be services needed for the enjoyment and use of the rented dwelling unit. And the language in the bill is essential services refers to the basic needs such as running water, electricity, gas, or hot water. And so this is very, sp pretty specific. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that that's, you had a discussion about that or how that came to. Yes, we did. The, our proposal was based on Hawaii law, uh, but this, this worked out to be acceptable. It's fine. It's actually, I think, a little better. It's a little more down to earth and specific. The Hawaii law was kind of out safety and pretty and you know, it's hard, how do you enforce something? This becomes very enforceable and protects the tenant better, I think. Right, it is much more specific, the Hawaii, yeah. I mean, for the enjoyment and use of the rented dwelling is kind of, so it makes it easier for us to, or for the government to enforce. So, yeah, we certainly want to ensure that, and, and I'm also pretty shocked that we've all been operating all, these, all this time without a Landlord-Tenant Act. Um, so I certainly want to thank um, the chair for her leadership on this, but also all of you for coming to the table and making sure that we have an equitable 
um, solution going forward. So Sidus Masi for your time. Thank you. Okay, I believe now that exhausts our uh, items on the agenda. Thank you again for all of you coming. And the time is now 2.54. 1.54. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day. God bless.